This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. This river has been known by quite a few names over the years. Ancient Egyptians called it Ituru, meaning river, and Arg, meaning black, after the fertile black soils deposited along its floodplains year in and year out. It's also been nicknamed Father of Life and Mother of All Men. But despite its many names, one thing is for sure. The Nile is the longest river in the world and has been the lifeblood of Egypt since the dawn of time. The diversity of life and civilizations that have lived along its great banks for thousands of years have made Egypt home to some of the richest history in the world. This week, we take a journey through the ancient history of Egypt and also meet some modern Egyptians who call the banks of this magnificent river their home. I am Liu Feifei. Welcome to Talk Africa. Egypt is home to innumerable wonders, some of which are still being discovered today. We begin our journey of exploration here in Upper Egypt to find out more about this amazing country. We're actually in the city of Luxor, which is home to the Valley of the Kings and also the great temples of Luxor and Karnak. And to tell us more about all of this is a noted Egyptologist and also publisher of the Luxor Times, Mr. Mina Malad. Hi, Mina. How are Hi, you? Fine. It's very Good nice morning. to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. Now, you're the first Egyptologist that I've gotten to meet in my life. So tell me, what is an Egyptologist? Well, you have to study Egyptology uh, at university for four years at least. And Egyptology is the study of ancient Egypt. Uh, history, art, culture, uh, language, religion. So what you're saying is someone could be actually an archaeologist, uh, an architect, a historian, or even an art historian. Which area of study did you pursue? The history of ancient Egypt. Now, most little boys, when they grow up, I assume, want to be like a policeman, a fireman, even a doctor. What was it that drew you to the study of ancient Egypt history? I actually started here in Luxor, a few steps from here. I was five, and I was here on holiday with my father, uh, where the Sphinx Avenue was still covered. And there was a small wooden gate, and between the beams of the wooden gate, uh, I was able to see Luxor Temple lit at night, and it looks magnificent then, and that's when I got hooked on ancient Egyptian history. Egypt is known as the cradle of civilization. Ancient Egyptian history goes back so many thousands of years. Can you condense that into some highlights for the average person to understand? Well, uh, the history of ancient Egypt started with the settlement of people around the Nile Valley uh, because then it was easier to have a settlement, not just trying to move from one place to another for hunting or looking for food. So the Nile actually gave life to Egypt and to the Egyptians. And from there, they started developing the civilization. They developed uh, the language, and that was important in any civilization. How many years ago are we talking about? This is like about four, I want to say four or five thousand years ago. It started about 5,500 BC, so over 7,500 years ago. Uh, but Egypt at the time, it wasn't still a state. It became a state 3,500 BC, so over 5,000 years ago, when the uh, king at the time called Narma or uh, Mina uh, united Lower and Upper Egypt into one country and one kingdom. And that started then the uh, the dynastic Egypt. This is fantastic and here we are so what a great opportunity to explore the Luxor temple with you. Exactly, we're here today at Luxor temple so it's a good chance to show you the temple so let's go inside. Let's go, I'm very excited. Yeah so that's the temple facade and here we're at the main entrance of Luxor temple and you can see the facade with the six statues, two seated and four standing statues of Ravnes II. Uh, till three years ago it was only three statues 
You see this one here, uh, it was re-erected in uh, April 2017, and then this one in April 2018, and April 2019 this year. So it's ancient Luxor temple, but in fact, it's quite new. Yeah, the restoration process doesn't stop all the time because you have to keep the monuments in shape to preserve them for the next generations. We're walking into the main entrance of Luxor. Yeah, Luxor temple, it's always been the main entrance. When you get Ramses the second to close statues here, uh, showing the king seated uh, before we go through the first pylon. A pylon, tell us what exactly is a pylon? A pylon is the structure around the gates from both ends uh, and you go through it and then you get the uh, open courtyard. And these structures here, they would have been here for thousands of years. So we're yeah. really stepping into history now. Exactly, about 3,400 years. Wow. Through all these rise and falls of the various dynasties and pharaohs, um, what role has the Nile played in the life of Egyptians? Well, without the Nile, as Herodot, the uh, Greek historian, said, uh, Egypt is a gift of the Nile. Well, it's a gift of the Nile and the Egyptians, of course. But uh, the Nile played a major role of making the people settle around the Nile in this land and create a civilization. Because without a sustainable, sustainable uh, source of water and food, uh, people would be like nomads and traveling all the time. Uh, but of course, they had to, because when they found a source, so they settled around the uh, banks of the Nile and built the civilization. Now, when we look back through these thousands of years and all these different kingdoms, what are some of the great pharaohs that, as an Egyptian, you are still proud of today? Well, there are so many, like Ramses II. We are standing here at his uh, court, at uh, Luxor Temple, and you can see his big statue there. He was really a master of propaganda, and he used to leave his name everywhere. Even if it wasn't originally his, uh, he would just put his name and his cartouche with his name and claim it for himself or use uh, some of the monuments for himself and you know he uh, he was a king for 66 years so he had long time to do uh, to do this he had over 70 wives and over 120 children and he outlived 12 of his sons so even the one who uh, succeeded him to be the king was uh, Mern Betah uh, he was number 13 so he was the lucky 13 Oh, I had no idea there's a lucky 13. That's always good to know, right? I think for the average person, though, like myself, um, there are certain names that we've become familiar with, like Nefertiti, Cleopatra. Was she also considered a part of ancient Egypt, or is that moving already into modern times? Well, Cleopatra can be considered the last ruler of ancient Egypt, because after that, the Romans came to Egypt, and Egypt became Roman boffins uh, uh, for for a long time after that. Now, speaking of this great civilization, I think one of the great things that have been left behind um, for all of us, for humanity, are these colossal um, creations, architectural wonders. Can you um, tell us what some of the main ones are in Egypt? Well, of course, the Great Pyramid, you can't beat that. It's the biggest structure uh, was ever built in, uh, in ancient Egypt, and it took over 20 years to finish. Uh, you, you have obelisks uh, all over Egypt. Well, many of them are abroad now, but you still have obelisks here in Egypt. Uh, and the craftsman's man Sheb was brought into this monument, especially the Colossae one. It's phenomenal because even with modern day technology, some would be difficult to make. Speaking of pyramids, I've learned that they're actually over 118 pyramids that have been 124 identified. to oh be precise. Goodness. 124 pyramids, and um, that they were actually built to launch the pharaohs um, into their afterlife. Can, can you tell us about the symbolic um, importance of the pyramids? Well, the pyramid was the uh, development of the uh, tomb. Like ancient Egyptians start uh, burying the deceased in a bed with leather around, and then they start doing the mummification. Uh, the tomb developed into what we call mastaba, which is one step, uh, you know, built over the tomb. And then the mastaba developed into a pyramid with six mastabas, which is the step pyramid. 
and after that became bigger structure like the Great Pyramid and the other pyramids. And some pyramids like were not even made as tombs, they were just symbolic ones uh, and much smaller ones, not all 124 as big as the Great Pyramid. Uh, some of them are small because they're just the symbol uh, and the shape of a pyramid. They didn't have uh, bailout chambers for the king in it. Let me take it back one step. We are here in the city of Luxor, which has, of course, great historical significance, and you have a lot of these colossal monuments. Tell us about what you have in Luxor. Oh, where to start? Like, we have, of course, Luxor Temple is standing there. We have Karnak Temple Complex, uh, consists of 14 temples. And it's considered the second largest uh, religious uh, structure building in the world with a roof. Uh, of course, we have the Valley of the Kings and Valley of the Queens. Uh, we have funerary uh, temples on West Bank, because West Bank considered to be like city of the dead. So the deceased would be there, would be buried there, and would be temples uh, to actually make offerings for the deceased and for the gods, their sanctuaries. Uh, so, and we have also the nobles' tombs, uh, more than 400 of them. Of course, Luxor is the ancient city of Thebes, which was the ancient capital. Why do you think the pharaohs of yesteryears picked this particular place to put their capital? Well, as I said, when the Hyksos uh, invaded Egypt, so uh, the kings of Egypt at the time, the Egyptians, they had to move from the north to retreat till the nearest place where they can start uh, trying to prepare for the war to regain the land back. And that was the start from it. That was here in Thebes. Uh, Thebes is the uh, Greek name. It's called to, uh, used to be called Wasit. That's an ancient Egyptian name uh, for it. So that's where they were based. And that's uh, where they started fighting the occupation. So when they came, they started building the Luxor Temple, which is different from all other temples, right? Because the Luxor Temple is actually, instead of being dedicated to the cult gods or dead pharaohs, it's dedicated to the rejuvenation of kingship. Tell us about that. Well, a Luxor Temple, it was uh, the, like the bigger part of it was built by Amenhotep III. And because uh, he wanted to uh, establish himself as a uh, uh, like the ruler of Egypt at the time in the field, uh, since he wasn't born from a royal wife and he wasn't married uh, to a royal princess. So he built a temple and he, uh, to tell the story that he was born from God Amun Ra himself, straight from the God. That's why, and also the other reason to please Amun Ra priests at that time and get him on his side. So he built that temple. Uh, and also it's dedicated to the Tyriad of Luxor which is Amona, his wife Mut, and their son Khonsu. In modern society today, we are surrounded by artificial intelligence, big data, self-driving cars and aeroplanes, and even genetic engineering. How do you think all of this ancient Egyptology still relates to modern day life? Well, uh, many of the Egyptian knowledge buzzed on through the years to the Greeks and then they buzzed it on to the Romans and then to all over Europe and from Europe to North America uh, in mathematics and architect as I uh, uh, as you may know like the invention of a colon that was invented in Old Kingdom by M. Hotob the famous architect who built the uh, step pyramid before that no one knew what a column was he invented that uh, also in mathematics and everything uh, the shape of a pyramid itself and its uh, significance in mathematical side all coming from ancient Egypt. And besides that, I understand that these carvings um, on the structures are also being brought back to life by technology. Yeah, like when you look at the hieroglyphic, it's mainly uh, like symbols uh, used, uh, maybe uh, uh, shapes of the sun or animals or whatever. And we use now the emojis. So it's more or less we, after all that development of civilization went back to using symbols. And the great thing about your uh, thousands of years of history is that it doesn't seem to stop giving. Even today, there are new archaeological discoveries being made, right? Back uh, a few months ago, there was old mummies being newly rediscovered. Yeah, uh, there were here in uh, Luxor on the West Bank, there were 30 wooden coffins discovered in an excellent uh, shape with the mummies intact inside. Uh, they dated back to 26th dynasty, so it's about 3,000 uh, years old. 
uh, and every day we get new discoveries all over Egypt, not just in Luxor, new tombs, new even pyramids. Uh, you would think, how can you miss a pyramid and you discover one? But sometimes you discover remains of a pyramid. Sometimes people would uh, uh, use the blocks in ancient times, but you still get the remains of a pyramid. This is so fantastic and it's been great talking to you. It's been one of my childhood dreams come true to be here in Luxor. So thank you very much, you very Nina. Much. We're off now to the Karnak temples, where I believe um, there's the greatest open air museum in the world. You will be amazed. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And now we have arrived at the Karnak Temple, which is a part of the world's largest temple complex. Joining us is Mr. Tayyip Garib, who is the director here. Tayyip, thank you so much for joining Hi, us. Thank you so much. So when we left Luxor, we were leaving an avenue of the Sphinxes. And as we go in here, I see also you have an avenue of the Sphinxes, but they have a different head. Tell me, what is the significance of this? So uh, actually, the ancient Egyptians, they used to make this kind of Sphinx Avenue in front of the gates and the entrance of their temples. Why they did this kind of Sphinx Avenue here? Actually, the symbol of this statue it's the god, the symbol of the god Amun. They wanted to gather the different power in the nature in just one part, in one unit. Here we can see the lion body and the ram head, and this is the representation of the god Amun Ra. The god Amun Ra, he was the universal god, and they represented the god Amun Ra here in two rows to protect the visitors for the temple. Uh, why they represented the god Amun-Ra in this shape? Actually, uh, the lion of the body, it was the symbol of the power, and the ram head, it was the symbol of the fertility. So they wanted to represent the glory of the god, the perfect god in this shape. The word Karnak itself has a deep meaning, right? As I understand it, it means fortified village. Tell us more about this fortified village. What is this Kar uh, Karnak temple complex composed of? Actually, Karnak temples, we think that they choose this place, which was an island surrounded by water, to uh, do this temple, which was a very simple temple or a very simple shrine at the beginning. And generation after generation, they uh, uh, do, uh, uh, they did a lot of temples, a lot of uh, statues, a lot of uh, 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 shrines, more than 2,000 years. They uh, establish all of these amazing buildings, dedication for different kinds of gods and goddesses, queen and kings, all of this in one area, more than 100 hectares. We are talking about more than 14 temples for the gods and goddesses uh, inside Karnak temples. This is also known as the greatest open air museum in the world. What are some of the key features here that if a visitor comes, they should definitely check out? That's right. Uh, when we are talking about the greatest uh, open air museum, so we are talking about Luxor. Because we have a small open air museum here in Karnak Timbils. Uh, this is just some shrines and blocks which we found uh, all of them as filling inside some uh, different uh, places and buildings inside. And this is, belongs to the Egyptian civilization. And we reconstructed all of these buildings again in the over in air museum uh, but Luxor in general now uh, it's uh, the open air museum why because it's a part of the history of the Egyptian history which uh, lived on this land since seven more than seven thousand years the first gate this is the biggest and greatest gate in the Egyptian civilization and despite it's unfinished and we can see from here the statue of the god of the King Ramses, one of the most important kings in the Egyptian civilization. And from here we can see the Holy of Holies in the central area of Karnak temples. And the Holy of Holies, this is the most important part of all of the temple because actually it was the place of the uh, golden statue of the god Amun-Ra, which was of pure gold. And of course, the two obelisks 
which standing until this moment in situ in its original place. You know, Egypt itself could be called the open air museum because so. you have amazing archaeological sites everywhere. Um, the most visited one is the Giza pyramids, of course. The second is here. Why do you think year in and year out so many visitors from all over the world are drawn to this spot? I think that it's very important for the people to come to visit this uh, civilization. We are talking about these people who lived here since 7,000 years and they succeeded to build this in spite of there is no machines, there is no um, kind of technology and they succeeded to build and uh, colored and uh, they did amazing work. I think it's very important for anyone to come to visit, to see and to believe that uh, we had these uh, people who lived on this land at that time and they succeeded to build this kind of constructions, huge constructions without any kind of technology at that time or machines. So much to see in I so little so time. Thank, Thank, you. You so Thank you so much. And now it's time for us to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to hop onto a felucca as we continue our journey of exploration down the Nile. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. For thousands of years, Egyptian civilizations have lived along the banks of the Nile and have relied on it for both its life-giving water and also for transport between Upper Egypt in the south and the Mediterranean. We leave Luxor now and travel northwards on the River Nile to Egypt's present-day capital, Cairo. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Cairo is one of the largest cities in Africa and is located in northern Egypt, also on the banks of the Nile. It's a bustling metropolis of over 20 million people and reflects the diversity and richness of thousands of years of cultural history. Not all of this history is found in museums though. There's so much right here in Cairo streets and in the traditional cuisine of Egypt. On the next step of our journey, I leave behind archaeological history to try some local foods which have been a part of Egyptian history for thousands of years. Egyptian cuisine is legendary and there are so many dishes to choose from. But I've been told there are several local delicacies that I must try. And what better place to do that than at a popular local restaurant? Come on! Ibrahim, we've just come from Luxor and we've learned so much about the pharaohs and Egyptian history. Are there any foods that are passed down directly from the time of the pharaohs? Grilled meat. This is the one kind of food from the time of the pharaohs that people still cook to this day. It has developed over time though. It used to be cooked using wooden sticks but now we use metal skewers and then grill it. Also, whole sheep grilled over an open fire came from the pharaoh's time. But now we cut the meat into small pieces and put it on skewers 
then grill it over charcoal. And so almost everywhere you go, for example, if you say dumplings or wonton noodle soup or picking duck, you think about China and Chinese culture. I'm just wondering what kind of Egyptian food, Egyptian dishes symbolizes Egypt? One of the first things that comes to mind is ful yutamea. When you hear ful yutamea, then you know it's Egypt right away. Also, koshari and molochia. These are the foods that Egyptian people love. And so, do you have molochia here in your restaurant? We serve molochia here, and it is the best molochia. Other popular foods in Egypt are kebab and kofta. Even though these foods originally came from the Lebanese and Turks, Egyptians were able to change the taste and when people come from their other countries and eat it here in Egypt, they find that ours tastes much better than what is made in their home countries. When I've been walking around, I've seen a lot of spice shops selling various different spices. Um, what are the defining spices in Egyptian cuisine or ingredients. Our spices are simple and not complicated and this is what makes us unique. We don't use a lot of spice in our food. Our main spices are salt, hot pepper and cumin. We also use vinegar in our salads and to make Egyptian whiskey. Egyptian whiskey is like a dipping sauce that's served in a small glass along with the meal. It's something unique to Egypt and it helps give you more of an appetite before you eat. How did you get inspired to open a restaurant? It started when I was quite young. I was only 10 years old. Now, I've been in this field for 40 years making kebab, kofta and other grilled foods. We're always improving and opening new restaurants, but the most important thing is the quality of our food and the people who cook it. They are the ones who give quality and great taste to the food and people come back to order from us many times because we offer something unique. Well, Ibrahim, all this talk about food has made me very hungry. Do you suppose you can show me how to make some of these dishes? And more importantly, let me try some of these dishes. Yes, yes my brother Chef Fahmi can show you the kitchen where we prepare and cook everything. Please come with me. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. much to see and experience here in this amazing land, but unfortunately, we're out of time this week. So do join us again on our next show as we continue our journey through Egypt to explore more of life along the Nile. From me, Liu Feifei, and the team here in Egypt, thanks for watching and see you next time. Mm -hmm.